Welcome to the design, cost saving design and insurance under NEC contracts in Hong Kong. Legal and insurance insights co organized by CIC, NEC Asia Pacific, and HKICF. It is our honor to invite Mr. Pete Clayton and Mr. Alexander Rosati to speak for us. Well, hello again, everybody. We, we had some technical problems there, I understand. So um, I guess I should uh, just recap. So apologies to anyone who, who did hear this the first time. Um, and I think for those who, who maybe didn't, I should, I should go over it again. So I was starting to talk about the standard approach to uh, design under the NEC3 uh, engineering and construction contract um, and the simple provisions that that contract provides are core clause 21.1, the contractor designs the parts of the works, which the works information states he is to design. Uh, second bullet point, the contractor submits the particulars of his design as the works information requires to the employer's project manager for acceptance. And those uh, particulars should be accepted uh, unless the project manager thinks they don't comply with the works information or the law. Um, so, you can see there that the works information is a very important document under NEC. It sets out the uh, employer's various requirements and scope and specification and so on for a project. And also it should deal with the extent of the design obligations and, and any processes required for acceptance of the design. And the final two points on that slide, the chapter doesn't proceed with development work until the project manager has accepted the design. So obviously it's constraints on the progress of construction um, and the design can be submitted in parts uh, for acceptance if necessary. We then can understand the NEC to an optional provision that deals with the design standard. Now, those of you who are uh, professional designers, I'm sure will know that generally at common law, designers um, are obliged to exercise reasonable skill and care when doing design and providing professional services. And provided they've done that and they've at least discharged the level of skill that a typical average member of their profession would, then they won't be liable even if the design proves to be defective in some aspect. However, when contractors take on design, they end up owing absolute obligations, including fitness for purpose obligations, which means that if the design fails or is not fit for purpose, then they're going to be liable, even if they did exercise reasonable skill and care, putting that design together. So what this option does, when it applies, is it says the contractor is not liable for defects in the works due to his design, so far as he proves that he used reasonable skill uh, and care. And liable for defects, that's a defined term, defects can be, and in broad terms it means not in accordance with the works information. So if you fail to meet a specific requirement in the works information, it may be very absolute in nature um, under this clause, provided uh, you exercise reasonable skill and care, uh, you won't be held to the higher absolute standard. And there's been at least one case um, in the UK which has confirmed that this clause works uh, as intended and as I have described. So it's very important for contractors to have it. And then just turning to cost saving design under the standard NEC3. Now it doesn't have an express concept of cost saving design as such, but what it has under the target contracts, that's the options C and D, um, where the contractor is paid the cost of their works against the target price. They earn pain share or gain share in pre-agreed percentages, depending on where the final cost and their fee entitlement is against the final target, under those form of contracts, there's this provision. It says if the effect of a compensation rent, which would include changes to works information to, for example, reduce scope or reduce cost, if the effect of that is to reduce the total defined cost and the event is a change to the works information, then we come to the important words, which I've underlined, other than a change to the works information provided by the employer, which the contractor proposed and the project manager accepted, the prices are reduced. So in other words, 
project manager instructs a variation type compensation event, which reduces costs, the prices, the target are reduced. But if it's not that scenario, it's where actually the contractor has proposed a change to the works information. Uh, and then the, uh, that, that's been uh, then accepted by the employer and, and, and instructed by the project manager. The prices aren't reduced. So that means the target stays high, but the costs can be saved. And that means the contractor's got an enhanced chance then to earn gain share, whether it's 50 or 50 or whichever is in, uh, agreed in the contract in question. So there is an incentive there for the contractor to make proposals to reduce costs so that they can increase their chance of gain share. And that's part of the incentivization uh, which NEC target contracts are all about. And of course, both the employer and the contractor uh, benefit from sharing or savings when they're achieved. What the standard NEC doesn't tell you though is well, how does the contractor make a proposal? Could it just be the contractor saying, well, I think we should um, save some costs here? I mean, let's say you've got a, a bridge design and, and you've got piled and reinforced um, uh, concrete columns and so on, and the contractor saying, well, I think the piles don't need to be as deep, I think we can reduce the reinforcement, I think we can make um, uh, concrete grade maybe uh, not quite so, so um, uh, uh, rigorous and so on. You could just propose that, the employer could go away, ask the project manager to investigate it and instruct it um, as a compensation event, and arguably it would be triggered by this clause as the contractor proposed it. Or does it mean the contractor needs to actually provide some detail and actually come up with a proposal that shows exactly how um, cost saving uh, is going to be achieved and changes the design and so on? But it's not clear, so there's some flexibility there. And I can see some potential arguments sometimes where um, the employer, the project manager, or the contractor may, may each consider that it was their idea originally uh, to come up with this cost saving proposal. You could potentially get an argument about who whether this provision would apply or not. And I guess the key to managing that is good, good cooperation, good collaboration between the parties, contractors being clear when they are putting forward um, proposals intended to save costs. Onto the NEC 4, broadly the same as NEC 3 in these um, aspects, except that it introduces for the non target options, options A and B, it's fixed price contract and fee measurement terms, um, it, it introduces this regime. So we've got clauses 16.1 and 16.2 for all the options which say the contractor may propose to the project manager that the scope, which is the same as works information, it's just new terminology under any scheme, the contractor may propose that the scope is changed in order to reduce the amount of client based contractor for providing the works for doing the job. Project manager has four weeks to accept that uh, and issue an instruction, changing the scope, across the limitation, effectively changing the scope, or they may decide not to accept the proposal. And under options A and B, if the effect of the compensation event is to reduce the total client cost and the event is a change to the scope provided by the client, which the contractor proposed, so it could be a cost saving design coming out of the clause. 16.1 or 16.2 process, um, the uh, prices are reduced by multiplying the assessed effect of the compensation event by the value engineering percentage. So that's a percentage which will be agreed in the contract data at the outset of the contract. And so if it's 50 50, for example, uh, or 50%, it means that the uh, clients and the contractor will share equally in that cost saving uh, proposal and compensation. For option C and D, the position is the same, which is for NEC, which I just described. So those are the NEC provisions, and I've more or less verbatim set out the four provisions there. So you can see there aren't very many. Um, I'm now going to move to the government uh, of Hong Kong's um, additional conditions of contract and how they deal with design cost saving design. And what I'll say at the outset is that the additional conditions I'm going to talk about extend to 30 sides of detailed legal drafting, whereas I think the entire core clauses of the NEC contract are, are less than 30 sides. So we do have this very different style 
uh, and approach. So what is that uh, approach? Well, additional conditions of contract F1 and F2 deal with design generally, in other words, where contractors do elements of design. Um, straight away, there are uh, some new definitions. We've got designer, independent checking engineer. Um, they don't really need much uh, explanation, um, but both the designer and the independent check checking engineer must be acceptable um, to, to the, to the uh, to the client. Um, and also there's a process of providing check certificates for contractor's design, which will obviously provide uh, a check here. So straight away there's, there's, there's more control outside there. The contractor's design liability, there are uh, express clauses dealing with this, and it provides the design liability is the same as a professional designer, which would normally be reasonable and skill and care, of course, except there's obligations for fitness for purpose in relation to selection of equipment, plant, materials, and goods, which is actually probably okay because for selecting individual um, items and materials and so on, uh, uh, there would permit or be uh, obligations that would be at least reasonably fit for purpose in themselves. And the government's clause does go on to say otherwise that there is no obligation to ensure fitness for purpose of design generally, in other words, as a sort of working form. However, and this is really, really important, um, the contractor shall warrant that the contractor's design and its resultant work conforms to any performance specification or requirement referred to in the contract. So if in the scope or the, uh, the works information, there are some very specific requirements. So for example, uh, going back to the, 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 the my hypothetical um, bridge, if there are requirements that that shall not deflect by more than X millimeters, that's arguably an absolute obligation. But for the spec, well, you could have something that says, I don't know, um, the air conditioning in a building is not going to deviate um, outside certain fixed parameters at any time. Those arguably are all absolute requirements or perhaps performance specifications. And what this clause is saying is the contractor shall warrant that this design conforms to those, which I think is an absolute obligation. And there's been a case in the UK, quite recently, just this year, with quite similar sorts of amendments. It's a case relating to um, refurbishment of Blackpool's trams and, and a fancy new uh, uh, tram depot building. And it was similar there. There was a general statement that, that the contractor uh, uh, would um, exercise, reason, uh, sorry, exercise reasonable skill and care in preparing its design, but separately there was a warranty of performance uh, specifications and requirements. And that was found to be absolute. So contractors beware. So it's a major potential increase in contractors' liabilities. And obviously, to understand those, you need to check the scope and the works information in, in detail. Um, we then carry on with some, some, some mechanics. Um, so within a reasonable period before construction, the contractor submits two copies of their design, check certificates from the checking engineer, certified work drawings, satisfactory evidence of PI insurance. And then the project manager within a reasonable period, so not a set period, reasonable period, notifies the contractor whether the documents submitted meet the requirements of this contract. And construction cannot start until then. So clearly there's some things which, uh, in the spirit of NEC, the contractor, the project manager, are going to need to collaborate on it to make sure that um, people are clear what the reasonable period is and that things are going to happen in sufficient time. Everyone's going to have sufficient time to enable construction to uh, proceed smoothly. Because otherwise, what is a reasonable period? Far better if that's pre-discussed and put on uh, an accepted program, for example. Also, it's not entirely clear to me if you're the project manager administering one of these contracts, what is the obligation on you to check if those various documents there meet the requirements of the contract? Does that just mean you've got to check there is a check certificate, there are two copies, there are certified working, working drawings, <clears throat> and there is some evidence of insurance. Does that meet the requirements of the contract? 
or does the project manager have to dig a bit deeper and say, does the design actually work? Does it meet the requirements of the works information or the scope? In which case, there's some checking uh, of potential further liability and obligations. Maybe the answer to that will be in the um, project manager's own appointments. Maybe that will be clear what they have to do. Um, if not, it's an to there. Um, continuing on, um, project manager may require the contractor to correct any compliance of the design spotted at any time uh, without entitlement to compensation. Of it. So it's nice to say, as normal in contracts, the fact that the project manager may, may have apparently accepted and not objected to the design is not going to change contractor's obligations or responsibility for problems. Um, also, any change to the works information resulting from acceptance by the employer of the contractor's design shall not be a compensation event, fair enough, and the contractor's design shall be deemed part of the works information by the contractor. Now we come to the cost saving design uh, part of the additional additions, clauses F3 and F4. So what do we have here? Well, there's a whole set of requirements again for there to be a designer approved by the employer of any or satisfactory to the employer of any cost saving design. There's to be an independent checking engineer and check certificates. I guess of course that would be the same, exactly the same people as doing the underlying design if the contractor is doing some of the design to begin with. Um, but it, it really ties into a theme, which is that under government's uh, additional conditions, the onus as you can see is very much on the contractor to uh, provide the detail of any cost saving design uh, and to own it and take full responsibility for it. So how does it work then in practice? Well the contractor can at any time submit a cost saving design proposal and they must provide justifications with it to show reduction in the prices that result, uh, reduced time for completion, if that's uh, on offer, uh, reduced operation and maintenance costs, uh, any efficiency or value to the employer of the works that need to be approved, um, any enhanced construction productivity, um, or any other social benefits, which I guess could be wide ranging, I suppose, going back to our British example, if you've got less reinforcement, smaller piles, less concrete, then, then there's obviously uh, some environmental benefits and social benefits that perhaps reduce construction traffic demands as well. But you must also provide price schedules and rates, all the adjustments that will believe are going to uh, arise from the cost saving design proposal, and any estimated increase to the operation and maintenance costs. So again, on our bridge example, um, I'm not an engineer, but let, let's assume uh, that if you're using concrete of a lower strength and so less um, reinforcement, then, then maybe there's more risk of some deterioration and some running maintenance on the, on the outer faces of the columns and the concrete and so on. I don't know, but you get the general idea. Um, and then once that proposal goes in, the employer should decide whether to accept that proposal within six weeks uh, and assess overall savings, any changes to completion dates uh, and liquidated damages and agree all that with the contractor. Project manager must also confirm that the uh, uh, cost saving design is compatible with the works information. Um, and if the proposal is accepted, then there's a somewhat different approach to standard NEC. Generally, uh, although I have seen some slightly different variants of the additional conditions on this, but generally the approach is once the cost saving design is uh, accepted, the prices are immediately reduced, whether that's the lump sum price under option A or a target price under option D or whatever, um, they're re immediately reduced by the total amount of construction saving. But then the construction saving is shared 50-50. Chapter has to account for any increased O&M uh, costs that may arise from the proposal, and also has to pay the project manager's costs of considering and checking their proposal. And the contractor has paid that debt upon completion of the work, not of the SA designer, the overall works. And the contractor is, is fully liable for the contractor's uh, saving design, uh, similar 
to, to their, their liability for design generally, which I never know if it's okay, in relation to additional conditions and elements too. So that's the, uh, my overview of design and cost saving design. Some concluding thoughts. Well, to be a standard NEC uh, comes across as simple, fair, but it is a little ambiguous. As I say, it's not entirely clear how a contractor is to put in their cost saving design proposals. It's also not entirely clear who is responsible for them. At standard NEC, the idea is that the contractor makes a proposal and there's an instruction to the project manager to change the work's information or whatever, which on the face of it would make the um, employer responsible for the acceptance of a design proposal. But I suspect that more, that's all going to depend on exactly how a particular proposal comes about. Tractor puts forward a very detailed proposal on the standard NEC and the employer accepts it, but then it fails. The tractor may, I suspect, still kind of some liability for that. The contractor merely says, well, I just think we ought to have a look at reducing the size of the piles or maybe a bit less um, at reinforcement. They don't do much more than that. Then the employer or the project manager completely investigates it, designs it, checks it, and issues it as a complete solution. Clearly, in that situation, they would have responsibility for it. But overall, I think Standard NEC gives very good incentives to contractors to suggest cost saving design options. By contrast, the Hong Kong version of NEC is complex, it's more onerous for contractors. Um, it's certainly a lot more long-winded in its drafting, with about 30 or so pages. But I think overall it's fairly clear um, who does what, how it happens, where the responsibilities lie. And there are still some good incentives for contractors, but they come with a cost. So you've got to pay project managers' costs of reviewing your proposal if you put one forward. You are going to assume design liability for your proposal even if it relates to an area of works that you weren't designing uh, originally. And of course, in an extreme situation, cost-saving design could really be correction of a bad design the employer's design has done in the first place. So why should track and pay cost the owner checking that and so on? So I do think um, uh, the, the cost-saving design regime, the design regime, um, is, is not as good for contractors as standard NEC, but hopefully it does still uh, include some good uh, incentives for um, cost savings and sharing benefits between employers and contractors, which is what NEC is all about. Well, thank you. That concludes my part of the presentation. And I'll come back later to deal with some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for an excellent talk on the design under NEC3, um, cost saving design under NEC3 and NEC4, and your insight into the Hong Kong government additional additional contract. Um, and your thought, concluding thought on the use of NEC. Obviously, as I introduction said, um, NEC is a baby of Peter's expertise. So, um, if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free, free to uh, type in the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to deal with your question at a good time. Um, for those who are late coming into the webinar box, um, I'd like to remind you, if you want to get your e-certificate, uh, please leave your email address, your name, um, with, in the Q&A box with the name, um, with an asterisk as a separate tree. For example, Chen Tai Man, asterisk Chen Tai Man at mc.exchange. So the host will check your, um, your name in the Q&A box against your registry name and then uh, if it's the same, they will send you the yeast they gave the email. Okay, without further ado, may I, I would like to introduce our second speaker tonight, Mr. Alexander Rossotti, talk about 
insurance under NEC contract in Swiss. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to T and, of course, Peter and everyone on, on the committee and uh, with this uh, presentation together. Uh, just uh, wanted to say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as as uh, you've heard, I work for Marsh Hong Kong uh, Limited as an insurance broker. I've also had previous careers as, a, as an attorney, also as uh, someone as an insurance claims professional and also as an insurance underwriter. This is an insurance legal and regulatory professional. So I've been in the business for a while and I've done construction on a number of levels from a number of different angles and it won't um, hopefully date myself too much, but I think the first construction project um, that I worked on from an insurance perspective was the Big Dig in, in Boston. I worked uh, uh, underwriting the Freedom Tower in New York City, <coughs> uh, the Crossrail Tunnel in London, um, so the Crossrail Project, I should, should call it, uh, and of course, there's any number of uh, large civil uh, engineering and construction projects here in, in Hong Kong. So um, I've sort of been around the block, so to speak, um, and so, you know, we'll get to sort of the big question, which I'm sure everybody has, which is uh, in reference to uh, NEC contracts and particularly the cost saving design. Um, is it covered, generally speaking, under a professional indemnity contract of insurance? And the answer is yes, it is. So there, that's it. I'm done for today. And that's the end of my presentation. No, I'm just kidding. It is not that easy. Nothing is ever that easy. Uh, particularly in the world of insurance. Okay, so as an old uh, uh, hand at being a legal advisor, I will tell you that the answer is, of course, that it depends. Okay? So I think what we need to do is um, first kind of take a step backwards and kind of look at the state of the professional indemnity insurance market, um, just generally speaking, uh, so that we can kind of understand the issues and the situation right now in the market. And then what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about what the contract, the professional indemnity insurance contract, is designed to cover. Because that's the type of policy that we're talking about here. There are many different insurance products that pertain to the construction sphere and to the design sphere and, and that area. So there's construction all risk policies, there's general liability policies. Um, but the, the thing that really we're concerned with right now is what's called the professional indemnity insurance contract, which, which is, just get a little bit ahead of myself here, <clears throat> which is, um, what is uh, what we're talking about as far as what covers this type of risk, which is the risk of design engineering professionals, reference to their designs given for construction, uh, whether it's under the NEC or frankly under any other contract as well. Um, so but let's take a little bit of a look at the state of the market right now. Um, and this is the part where I'm going to scare everyone because um, the market is, is definitely in a state of flux uh, as far as uh, people, insurance companies, having issues with underwriting, losses in underwriting book, which is uh, leading to uh, terms being changed, that there's a, a shrinkage of, of what's covered under these policies. And of course, a, at the same time, also uh, premium is going up. So. If you look at um, this, this sort of chart, which is actually all these charts are based on uh, full year 2018. Um, it, they're about the same for 2019. I just didn't have any charts, so I will have to deal with these ones. But, uh, but essentially speaking, what you can see is if you, if you take out the all other professionals side of this equation, um, you can see that design and construction right, is a major, major source of, of the participation in the market of the entire market of professional indemnity insurance, which includes, as you can see here, lawyers, accountants, technology, and of course the big section there, which is every single other kind of professional um, that could conceivably cover, be covered under a professional indemnity or PI policy. But as you can see, that big sort of light blue uh, slice of the pie in the upper right-hand corner is quite large. So this is a big, big segment of the PI insurance market is design and construction. So, okay, so yeah, so there's a lot of, of the market is made up of design and construction. Um, so what does that mean? Well, uh, as far as the risk is concerned for insurers, 
again, as I said, the market is in flux. Right now, what we're seeing is that there is a, a lot of claims being paid and premium is, is low, right? So these, again, are 2018 numbers, but I, I assure you that right now has not gotten better in 2019 and 2020, right? So as you can see, we're looking at uh, upwards of, of above 250,000 pounds. And, and this is uh, out of the London market, which is kind of where most of this lives from a global perspective in losses. And, and then in premium, right? It's, it's uh, under 150,000, just about, I should say, uh, pounds, okay? 150 million, sorry, 150 million, 250 million, We're talking very large numbers, right? So, um, you know, when the market starts experiencing 100 million pounds of loss, it changes the equation of the market and the market's approach, the insurance market's approach to this risk. So, we can make it very, very simple. Claims payments going up, premiums still down. The insurance companies have to do something. What are they? What are they doing? The answer is they're trying to either get out of the market. Some insurance companies have gotten out of the market. We've also seen increases in premiums, so premiums are going up a lot in certain instances. And of course, the coverage that is offered by these policies is being shrunken down as much as possible. So uh, in real world terms, what does this mean for design professionals, architects, and engineers? It means you're gonna pay more for your insurance and your insurance is going to cover less. Okay? And that trend we expect to continue as, as the market continues to deal with some large losses over time, right? So, okay, so, okay, Alex, you scared me, right? This is all scary. Premiums going up, coverage is going down. Um, you know what can we do about it? So this leads us to the concept of overall risk, as opposed to what is insured risk, right? So if you are an architect and an engineer, you have risk. You have all sorts of risks, right? You have people who come to the work site. They, they're employees that might get injured, right? So you need employees' compensation insurance. You might have financial risks. So you might get some type of a, a special instrument or, or a line of credit or something that will deal with some of the risks that you have from a financial perspective. So you have design risk. You have risk of, of counterparty failure. So how do you deal with the fact that um, you're the, the owner of the project might go out of business and not pay you? How, how do you deal with all these different types of risks, right? So your risk picture is very big and very large. And, and everything in it is, is the world of risk for you. There are many different ways to deal with risk. Now, from a standpoint of the risk that we're concerned with here today, we'll sort of take, take all those other risks and kind of put them on the side. So employee compensation or financial risk or things of that nature, we're gonna sort of put them off to the side. Although I will say that from the perspective of Marsh as, as an insurance broker and I as an insurance professional. We also, uh, as a broker, deal with risk management. We don't just deal with, we don't just get you an insurance policy. We deal with how to manage your entire risk. So risk can be managed in any different ways. You can control your risk by taking uh, safeguards and precautions in what you do on the work site. You can, of course, transfer some of your risk to an insurance company, which is what insurance is. You're, you're still taking the risk, but you're transferring, right? Or you can finance your own risk uh, and set up, say, your own um, control of the insurance company, which is called a capital, or finance it some other way. Um, so all of these, these things are ways to control risk. And risk control or risk management is what Marsh specializes in. But if you are a, an engineer or an architect, you should be thinking about your risk holistically. You should be thinking about how to control it. And so, again, so we're going to put a bunch of the risk on the side. Again, Marsh can help you with all those risks. We're just going to talk about risk of professional indemnity. I think you uh, heard it before because 
um, it's sort of set out in the NEC contract itself. And in most contracts, it will say, as long as you use reasonable care or professional under the circumstances, then that meets your standard of liability under most contracts, right? So if you're an, an architect, you're supposed to use the standard, you're supposed to meet the standard of care and do the things that an architect is supposed to do under similar circumstances in this, right? So this is this is sort of the area where your PII policy lives. Okay. So these policies go back a very, very long way. They're, they're quite historical type of products. And they have at their basis the concept that they are designed, right? Just start to look at some of the policy language. They are in fact designed to cover that situation where you have not met the standard of care or professional under similar circumstances. That's what we call the common law sort of definition of being professionally negligent, right? Want of care for a professional under the circumstances, okay? This is what these insurance policies are designed to, okay? So this is the center of the risk for PI policy. So we'll take a look at some of this language so you can see it. So this is the main, this is what we call the grant of cover under a PII policy, okay? It covers you for professional liability. Insurer will pay on behalf of an insurer all loss resulting from any claim against any insured for a civil liability arising from or out of, depending on the contract language, just this one I just have to, happen to pull out, arising from or out of professional services. So what are our professional services? Professional services, as you can see in the definition, is those services performed by an insured under the contract, professional design or specification. Building engineering, in this particular, particular policy, again, this is one I, I pulled sort of off the shelf. Right? Um, supervision of construction, visibility, technical information, calculation or survey, so surveys being performed by a properly qualified person. They do not include supervision by an insurer of its own or its subcontractor's workmanship. Such supervision is no different from that which we would be expected of an insurer and only had workmanship and or management obligation. Also includes duty to warn of defects and professional activities of others. You see someone doing something wrong, right? You're supposed to report what we all know. That. Okay. So basically what this is saying is this policy will cover you if you do not meet that standard of care for a professional under the circumstances. Right? So now we know basically what, what the policy covers, right? So let's talk a little bit about exclusions because I think this is where NEC and particularly the, the cost saving design kind of comes into play. So again, the policy is designed to cover that sort of common law liability of not meeting your standard of care, professional negligence, okay? So what does it not cover? The answer is a whole bunch of things, but um, and we're not going to go into tons and tons of details in these policies. Certainly, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out and contact us. We can talk about all of these things in the context specifically of your risk and your situation. But contractual liability is written out of, the, of this particular policy. You know, you're saying, wait a minute, I have a contract. It said, didn't it say contract in the definition? And the answer in, in the grant of cover. And the answer is, Yes, yes it did, but you have to remember that the policy again is designed to just cover your professional negligence. So if you have a contract that says a bunch of things other than that, policy will generally try and write those out of cover. So look at the language. Policy will not cover loss in connection with the claim arising out of, based upon, attributable to, super broad language, liability assumed or accepted by an insured any contract or agreement or guarantee or warranty. Okay, so that's pretty broad, right? It's like, well, wait a minute, what the heck does this policy cover? It doesn't cover liability assumed by, by the contract. The answer is read the rest, right? Except to the extent such liability 
would have attached to an insured in the absence of such contractual duty, term, or agreement. So again, we're still, the policy is saying, we're only covering you in the contract those things that would normally be part of your liability for being professionally negligent. If you're guaranteeing something else or warranting something else, it's generally not going to be covered under your policy. And, um, you know, again, this is, this is subject to your particular policy situation and your particular, particular factual situation. Remember, if you're warranting, say, that you are going to meet a certain uh, time schedule in the contract, we will finish this construction by such and such a date, and you don't, even though you otherwise used good and due care on the situation for a profession. Well, and then you get sued because you didn't meet your, your, your warranty to, to finish the construction by a certain date. It wasn't due to any negligence. It just didn't make it, right? Because it's construction. Construction, you no, know, it's like a big sloppy thing sometimes, right? You don't meet your deadlines. I mean, who, who meets all their deadlines in the construction? I mean, yet, uh, Peter, will, Peter will attest to the fact that we've worked on some litigation ourselves that have, has at its base just that. It's like, you know, construction is not a guaranteed thing, right? There's there's overruns, there's issues, there's a flood, there's a, a, a typhoon, whatever it is, right? But those things that you warrant that are outside of that the initial part of professional negligence sometimes are not covered. Um, another part of, of this, which is interesting, is, is cost assessments. Policy doesn't cover loss arising out of any failure by any insured uh, or any other party acting insured to make an accurate pre-assessment of cost of performing professional services. So a lot of the cost overruns or things that happen in this, in this particular context will not be covered. Again, back to the same issue, which is what is this policy designed to cover at its core? That is your professional negligence. Didn't do something that normal run of the mill engineer or architect, architect is supposed to do, that leads to some sort of bad thing that happens. Well, that's going to be covered, right? But if you warranty sun, moon, and the sky or to meet whatever, uh, whatever crazy schedule is, you know, may not be covered. So you do have to be careful about guarantees or warranties. So what does that mean for the NEC contract and particularly some of the changes that are, are in this particular document? The answer is, well, taking the first thing that we're all talking about here today, which is the cost saving design. So a cost saving design in and of itself is, is not going to, is not going to change your coverage under the under the policy. PII is still going to cover you if you make a mistake or a negligence, don't meet your standard of care in doing what you're supposed to be doing under the contract or whether it's under submitting a cost saving design. Okay. But to the extent that an insurance company or, or even you would, would guarantee or warranty something under that cost saving design that it will, in fact, lower costs. If you warranty that or guarantee that in any particular way under the, under the documents, right? In this instance, arising out of the construction project in and of itself, you're guaranteeing that. But you might, you might be outside of coverage if, if you don't actually save the cost. So again, remember, contractual liability or warranties or issues about what fees might possibly be owed. These are things that are, are likely outside the grant of cover. You do something wrong or, and are negligent in your design or in your engineering approach. That leads to an accident or um, a collapse or something of that nature happening. But then that's what this is designed to do. This is designed to, to address that particular service. So you do have to be careful when you look at um, things from the standpoint of approaching cost saving design, this, whether it's the NEC or any other contract for that matter, or any other situation where you're doing things that changes the initial contract. Be careful to guarantee a warranty situation. So again, we started off by talking about 
coverage under the policy, but then I said, let's take a step back and talk about risk, whole risk and how to manage risk. Okay, so assuming that some of this might be outside grants of cover under the policy, what do we do? What do we do to control the risk that some things that happen during cost saving design proposals and acceptances and things of that nature uh, don't lead to a situation where you are left without cover or left with a situation where you're, you're not controlling the risk. Okay? How do you manage the risk? How do you make the risk less? Well, the answer is, you know, it's going to sound fairly stupid and it's going to sound pedestrian. People will probably roll their eyes. Frankly, I'll probably roll my eyes as well. It, it comes down to, to the, the three shuns, as I like to, as I like to call them, right? Um, communication, right? what I like to call congregation, or in this instance, we'll, we'll call it aggregation, perhaps, because it's, uh, it's design and construction. Aggregation, right? And uh, documentation. So communication. If you are going to make changes to your contract in order to save, to save cost of design, for any other reason, right? or you're going to change the way you're approaching construction project, whether it's method, whether it's whether it's a change in, in materials, or whatever it may be, you communicate that clearly to all the proper parties that that are here, whether it's the owner, whether it's contractors above you, whether it's below you, whether it's whoever it is on this project. Make sure that there is communication to everyone. As to what the issue is. Then again, aggregation, right? Let's put everyone in a room and get them to agree. Okay? Let's get consensus. Let's make sure that there is an agreement to the approach that we are doing, an agreement to the change that we are making, right? So if everyone is in agreement, have your communication, you've had your aggregation, as we'll call it here, and then documentation. And I'll tell you, and I'm sure Peter will probably jump up later, he's probably itching to jump up now and say, cases that are won or lost by documentation, that's pretty much everything. Every case is won or lost, usually by some documentary issue. So if you have the strength of good documentation as to what you're doing, it makes it extremely difficult to lose these types of cases and it controls that risk. Because again, Policy is only designed to do so much. So if you are changing it, if you're making warranties, if you're making guarantees, make sure that you are controlling your risk in some other way. Again, question assist you with that. Okay. So um, again, there's there's exclusions. I'm going to talk about fitness for purposes. It's kind of a, a different, doing things in a different um, order here a little bit. But um, a lot of times policies will not cover any warranties that, that deal with fitness for purpose, particularly things like defective workmanship materials and things of that nature, although they will, if it, if it arises in some type of a context that has to do, again, with that central concept of meeting or not meeting um, the, the requirements of a similar, similarly situated design profession. So in this particular contract, they have an exclusion saying fitness for purpose. We're not going to cover you for, for contract works was not defined. Unseen ground conditions, process, pollution is always right out. So don't, it's usually not, not included unless it's very sudden and incidental um, and, and defective in workmanship or materials. So again, sometimes we'll see very broad language on, on warranties and fitness for purpose warranties or things arising out of of this area in these policies, right? So you have to be careful to make sure that your policy is, is properly tailored to you and as broad as it can be. But again, we're having situations where the market is not as is is not as accepting of changes and certainly trying to shrink them as opposed to is as opposed to increasing. So uh, last thing we'll we'll look at is there are extended coverage. So can certain instances get covered with fitness for purpose? This is a good example of that. And again, it says insurance will pay if they have insured, rising out of fitness for purpose warranty solely with respect to design under a specification works. Okay? Provided that the fitness for purpose warranty is in accordance with practice conventionally accepted as appropriate at the time. 
difference in size scope. Okay. So what this is saying is, even in this instance, they'll say, all right, we will cover you if you warranty that your design, your whatever it is you're doing, engineering of the site where you're approaching the construction, is fit for the purpose, but only with respect to the design and specification of the work. So you have to have design and specification of works and fitness for purpose to that specific design. So it can't be general, and as I saw from the exclusion before, just general statements on warranty for fitness or purpose may not be covered. So again, as you approach any cost saving design issues, these are things you have to be concerned with. So um, again, if you look at this definition, it, it also has in it a certain concept of what a similar design professional is supposed to be doing at the time. Right? So it's accepted as appropriate at the time of the execution of works. So, you know, covered kind of a lot of ground, and see my time is kind of stuck. Um, so, you know, basically what I'll, I'll, what I'll leave you with is uh, let's just say that when approaching these issues of working with the NEC contract, which is an excellent contract, because um, it, it in and of itself has a whole lot of clarity, um, and and but in approaching it, do need to remember that. It is only designed to be so only designed to be so many situations. And similarly, the insurance policy, the PII policy, is only designed to meet certain circumstances. It's not designed to be all circumstances. So when you handle your risk, approach your risk holistically, but understand that certain things only do so much within that particular um, in that particular field. Then the last thing I'll say is, and because I think that probably um, people are kind of wondering, there's a lot of requirements in, in the NEC policy in reference to what, what your insurance must have, how, you know, what you need to present, and what documents you need to have. And frankly, I looked at that, that two sections, F5 and F6, which I hadn't looked at in a long time, and I said, the answer to how do we handle those two sections contract is all your broker because all of those sections are what you present to us in order for us to make sure that we are giving you what you need to meet your risks in this particular situation and to meet your contractual requirements. So give it to us and we will assist with that issue. One thing I will say sort of conclusion as well is that as far as the policy is concerned, the PII policy, do not need to have a separate PII policy for the change in design itself, although it is in two separate sections in the NEC policy, um, just to make it clear that, you, that your policy must cover both of these things, both the contract and the change in design. But the PII policy will, if you've got the right broker, will be all of those requirements of the sections. So again, my, my takeaway is look at risk, risk holistically, if you are not sure about anything, call an insurance professional, call a legal professional, we can assist you. So I hope I didn't scare you too much, but again, if you have any questions or issues in reference to the II policy or the issues raised tonight, please reach out to us. So I'll turn it back to uh, TT and say thank you so much for the uh, opportunity and uh, I look forward to uh, taking any questions that you have. Thank you, Alex, for this really expert advice. Uh, for a number of us professionals, we always look at insurance. And I'm not sure what you, which part you find it difficult. I find the most difficult part of looking at insurance policy is exclusion. Usually 10 times in the number of pages than the coverage. <laughs> so you really have to look at the exclusion. So um, Alex talked with talk about a lot of insight as well as exclusion. I think you enjoy it very much. So for those who still have questions, please type in the Q&A box. We have a number of questions uh, on the first part. Um, we're, we're dealing with it. So for this Q&A session, uh, we need to do a little bit uh, setting. So prepare for a while.
Okay, may I invite the two speakers to come to the floor? <laughs> Not sure why I got the step in there. I'll take the middle. Monkey. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I miss very good. Um, obviously, the, the talk tonight is very welcome by the audience. We have a lot of questions. A lot, of, a lot of questions. So, um, in the interest of time, I don't think we are able to answer all your questions. So, parents, we are only able to um, take up a few. Uh, so, I'm trying my best to group those related questions together. And I'm, I'm surprised there are a common question coming in is COVID 19. Uh -huh. A number of questions are related to COVID 19. Uh -huh. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question to Peter is, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. the, let me see. The first question, very direct. Say a construction site is stopped due to COVID-19. Is it a compensation event? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, good, good question. Now, if you uh, um, um, understand it, well, I should say, if, if the construction has been stopped, and that's because the employer has said the site stops or they stop the access. Then it's straight for you. You're going to get time and money for that. If you're into the realms of, um, well, actually, I've got problems with my supply chain. I've got problems with you know, my workers and so on. Pace is slowing because of social distancing. Those types of issues are a bit harder. Now, uh, NEC, in its standard form, has a perfect solution for the contractor because it has a compensation event, things which stop the contractor completing by the completion date, which neither party vet, and which a, a reasonable contractor would not have allowed for um, a tender stage. And I think most people would accept that COVID fall into that category. Sadly, in Hong Kong, that provision has been amended. And without going into all the details of that amendment, it's probably only going to give time and not money that particular indeed government parts um, have recognized that already. So you're then back as a contractor looking at the other avenues, you know, has something been imposed on me as a result? Has, has an instruction to move into different ways? And um, is, is the uh, employer or other or third parties taking longer to do things and that's something in the context on me? Got to be a bit more inventive uh, and look at the detail of the tax contract. To, to find a financial claim. So that's my answer. Yeah, because there are a number of new uh, questions uh, related COVID. to COVID. So, so, <laughs> I, would, so, I, would, I would also point yes. out from, from an insurance perspective that, that most of the, the PII policy is not really designed to, to contend with COVID-19 related claims. You know, I suppose there could be a situation where you could say, who as design professionals should have thought about this, but it's, it'd be very, very difficult to see such a claim be successful. Um, some policies, in particular going forward, uh, have COVID-19 specific exclusions, um, but but obviously you know, there, there are some that were written previously, particularly on the construction hall risk side, that could have some implications, um, particularly from a business interruption perspective of COVID, but, but sadly, sadly, going forward, uh, uh, probably there are some um, relevant questions saying, does NEC has clauses to handle the case of false material? Can we argue that COVID-19 uh, well, is one of the can construction delay due to COVID-19 that be considered false material? That is hence compensation event. Yes, well, that's back to that clause I was mentioning in the standard NEC, which uh, NEC doesn't use the term false material. This is just that bit formalistic and, and loyally for, for NEC. It's this quite much playing a concept of events which stop the contracting and completing by the completion date and either party could control itself, which would cover most situations. I was saying Hong Kong it's, it's been amended to, to remove the money. Having said that, in most traditional contracts that, that have a force majeure, it tends to open up that money. It's like any so their question also is, due to COVID-19, if the transportation of construction material by sea is affected and delayed, which NEC clauses will cover this? And uh, would the main contractor be compensated for extra cost to catch up with delay? Uh, 
Well, I think it, it, it's well like my first answer. You've got to somehow fit it into some of the other compensation events under NEC. The first majeure type of things is, is potentially going to take more time. Um, but the money you're going to have to try and somehow fit it elsewhere. We do sometimes get changed in all provisions and any seat contracts in Hong Kong. Um, so you can see if somehow it fits with it. Then a change of law, you know, the, that has caused an impact and difficulty with that. Um, again, the government members tend to, to list out the laws which yeah. entitle you, you know, if these laws change, you will be entitled to a compensation of it. Unfortunately, they don't tend to include things related to COVID controls, it's things like buildings ordinance, you know, and changes. Time. So it, it's a tough situation on it. It requires ingenuity to, to, to all say it's the facts of a particular case to see if you can bring it to the contract. So there's a question for Alex. Also uh, about also COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Can we claim for extra cost for project insurance due to COVID 19 under NEC? Actually, uh, that's uh, not quite do we need to do it? Yeah. Uh, top of insurance because of COVID-19, put it that way. Yeah. So, so generally speaking, because the risk that the NEC contract is designed to, to require you to have coverage for um, COVID-19 would probably fall outside of those requirements, um, simply because it's not, it's the, the requirements for the NEC contract that you need to show insurance don't generally include a a, a nod towards problems because of some type of pandemic, right? So, so the answer is probably no. You would not be able to claim it, generally speaking, um, not under the requirements of the NEC contract as far as your insurance is concerned. I don't know if there's any implications on the contractual side whether you have grounds to go back to the owner. Well, yeah, I suppose yeah. it, is, it is the cost of the insurance, like additional yeah. premiums, then you know, okay. have, to, have to look at whether that's, I suppose, part of the compensation. But I can't remember off the top of my head if you can fit extra premium uh, costs within, within those cost settings that you can claim at the NEC. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, diff it's difficult. Yeah, it would, be, it would be difficult to get it back. Um, which is again the reason why, why from a risk perspective, look at all the risks that you have on these contracts. Going forward, there are there are some things out there, there are some products that are expensive right now, obviously, um, sort of like parametric cover type things where it'll cover you for a certain type of pandemic events if they're declared by the WHO in certain areas of geographies um, and uh, particularly going out there right now for Christmas Reef. Um, but but they're very expensive, um, you know. So trying to trying to ensure um, COVID lab perspective is, is quite expensive. But as far as the NEC is concerned, the NEC has its requirements that deal with um, the, the PII type risk under the contract, as opposed to sort of first party risk to you because pandemic interfered with your business. Normally speaking, that would be a requirement under the contract to get as a check. So many questions before we not so we change our <laughs> subjects. I think there will be more we so we let's yes. see. And um, just to say we are wearing masks when we're not on. Yeah, as soon as we're off, just off here, screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, question is can the contractor propose a change to the works information which will increase or has no change to the park? Well, well I mean uh, I guess a contractor can always propose that, 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 that change is made. If it's going to increase um, costs, um, I can't see why there would be an incentive to agree to that. Um, I mean, if there was some other benefit, you know, some other reason why it would be quite sure what that question is driving at. Yeah. It's probably something very specific someone's got in mind. I mean, I think you would probably, um, if if there if there's a situation where, for safety or design reasons, um, 
you know, have to propose a change under the contract uh, that might increase costs, you're still duty bound to do it because that's meeting your standard of care for uh, a professional in, in the field under similar circumstances. You can't not propose it simply because it increases costs. So I think you have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, there are field questions on the Carol. One question said, if the if the value to the employers is improved, the cost for for them reduced, but there is no change in terms of the construction fees. In this sense, what is the carrot for the contractor to propose a better design? Uh, well, that, that yes, but I I should have mentioned that in my part of the talk um, that, that when um, certainly under the government's uh, amendments, tractor cap forward a proposal just to reduce their amendments and then part of that sharing of the savings includes a share of that amendments. So that's the incentive. Um, I imagine it happens by the way. Yeah, we can track some share of the incentives and they are incentives. What is the incentive for a contractor to submit a cost saving design with earning less in revenue but increasing his liability under the Hong Kong government's arrangement of NEC? Well, um, it, 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 well, that's the trade off for contractors, isn't it? I mean, you, you've got to decide is it worth putting this forward because my saving is 50% you know, or whatever the saving is. Uh, and, and if doing that, you're taking on a design liability you otherwise wouldn't have. But yes, that's, that's a commercial um, judgment as, as to whether it's worth taking taking that that, that that risk or not. That is one. Of, I mean, it's a good example actually of how the government's approach here does reduce the incentives. And that's what I was saying on the final slide. You know, under the standard NEC, just forward a simple proposal, they don't have to pay for project managers to think about it, the employer decides to run with it, then probably the employer takes full ownership of it and, and, and it becomes financial. But, but clearly there are some tracks I'm sure we would, would see a benefit of taking some risk, making a proposal, um, uh, hope, hope it's all backed off with insurance. Yes, yes. Well, 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 anyway. well, it should be. Yeah, okay. yeah no, it should be. So yeah. if, if, again, you know, it's an old old advertising campaign for AIG way back in the day, and they did work for AIG, said the biggest risk is not taking the risk, okay? So insurance is there designed to help you take the risk. Again, if, if the issue is I'm putting forward a cost-saving design, yes, does, and particularly under the Hong Kong changes, does that sort of increase the, the possibility that there might be a claim against you um, because it didn't meet whatever the requirements were? Yes, it is. But again, if if that is a failing, that is a claim in professional negligence, you didn't meet the standard you're supposed to be, should be covered. Right? So um, you shouldn't be afraid to take risks. Um, you should just be trying to control them, or finance them, and or or share them. So um, that's probably take. That's a question. Actually, you deal with the first part under the Hong Kong government NEC. The CSD has to be checked by a third party engineering checker and confirmed by the PM. Otherwise, the contractor cannot commence work. Is the contractor relieved from the liability in case a collapse happens? Does PI insurance cover the claim? Uh, the fact that a third party has checked and signed off on your design does not necessarily does not necessarily you with liability if you also should have known the design was wrong. So in that certain instance, it doesn't insulate you from it. Again, the policy will address that particular law. So if there is a collapse, it'll and you get sued because they say, well, I know the third party signed off on it. He was negligent. So were you, because you should have known it was bad too. You both should have known it was bad. So I'm suing both. And in that instance, the PII Professional dental policy should step in and cover you, defend you. 
So I hope that answers that. Yeah. <laughs> and follow up. Does PII cover mistakes of contractors temporary work design? The mistake in temporary work design may or may not cause deficit in other companies. And and the answer is yes, usually, usually it will. So anything that is part and parcel of the entire contract or as part of your duties as a design professional, that's in there and don't meet the standard of care for a design professional, you, and there's a claim brought against you because of it, the II policy should cover it. That's a better question. As a design field contractor, do they need to procure additional PII for each proposed CSD? So cover liability or critical purpose? No, uh, not, not normal. So as I said before, your PII policy is, is designed to cover all aspects of what you do as far as a design professional in reference to this client, this project, mostly the client, right? So the other party in the contract. So it's designed to, to do that. Um, you don't need to get a separate policy every time you have a cost change in design or, or any change in the overall plan. That being said, we'll say it depends, right? Yes. Because if you have a very, very major change in the risk that's that's caused by, by some sort of change in design, um, you might want to go over with your broker and also let the underwriter and insurers know about it, um, just to let them know that there's been a fundamental change in the size and scope of the project. Yeah. And, and could I also add, yes. there could be a situation elsewhere the contractor had no design responsibility for the original job, but then they, so then they may not have policy at all. So. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. So interesting, right? So if if during the underwriting process, um, your, your, your policy was limited to certain certain areas of design, um, and you expand that, you definitely have to include that as part of the notification yeah. because you would definitely need to let underwriters and let the insurers know. But generally speaking. If you are engaged in a normal design professional a contract, um, you will not need to get a specific policy for your cost saving design um, most of the time. Again, remember what I said when I first I, I said it's covered, right? And I walked away, I said, well, no, it depends, right? So the answer is it depends. Um, and always consult your insurance and your legal professionals anytime you have any type of questions. And uh, yeah, so that's probably the best. The best policy. Honesty is the best policy. I think this question you might have already answered, but I just read out to see whether you you're happy with this. Is it what is your advice on the PII coverage related to contractor design and cost saving design under the circumstances with the happily amended provision to NEC standard terms through the incorporation of the F5 and F6? Yeah. So so Again, the F5 and the F6 is just generally speaking what you need to, to show, you need to have in place as far as a PII policy in, in the market. So the F5 and the F6, you know, you could kind of walk through it, kind of fall asleep about halfway through because it's boring. You know, talk to your insurance professional, talk to your broker, they will out, they will provide you what you need to meet your so generally speaking, as I've already said, there's not a there's not a special because there's F5 and there's F6. There's not a special contract for cost saving design, just PII. And as long as it meets the requirements of both sections, you should you should be good. I think as far as the we talked we touched a little bit about the the Hong Kong changes. Again, they they lead to greater potential for liability, um, and so you do need to make sure that when you are involved in, uh, involved in the underwriting process, that, that every all the terms of the contracts are disclosed, that insurers, the insurers know the risk they're getting into, so they can't say later, you didn't know, right? So as long as you do all those things, your insurance professional gets you a policy which meets all those requirements, you should be okay. Again, all the devil's in the details. So use the two of us and you should be okay. <laughs> One question going back to Peter um, about cost saving design. Cost saving design will will a proposed instruction under cost 65 adoption. What would be the best practice to manage the cost saving design under NEC? Well, 
I mean, I think I think the the proposed instruction under clause six as well. I think it's the proposed compensation that they bring to give a proposal for terms of itself. Um, I mean, that that probably would be the route whether the project manager is, is suggesting something. Um, the, the, the cost saving design provisions um, tend to, to come, come, come the, other, the other direction, either through the um, government's NEC proposal or just now that standard for So I, I thought normally it, it, the, the cost saving design provisions are going to And Alex, pressure is still flooding in. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't think uh, I don't think we can handle the answer on the question because it's already <laughs> ready. So I I um, decided to be the last question. Um, any practical advice both of you would like to give the contractor or tenderer if it is considering to factor in the saving in powering pool of the cost saving design in its tender price? Commercial. <laughs> <laughs> answer. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts on that are, in terms of advice, point number one, there's no guarantee that any cost saving design you propose is going to be accepted. So uh, I can see, you know, tenderers looking at the job and saying, ah, hang on, we could do this you know, cheaper, better, whatever. Um, and, and then you know, take a risk and sort of bit of cost or even a bit under cost, assuming that you're going to be able to get this cost saving design through later on. And, um, yeah, you can do that, but it, it's, it's a risk. Um, and and in a sense that it's more something that's better for a situation where you have early contractual involvement, which obviously is not possible. Um, but I guess if you're confident enough that the employer is going to see the wisdom of the cost of design, it could be a very smart way to win a job. Make a yeah. And as, as we said, with risk, as long as you approach it the right way, use the due care that you are, you're the professionals, right? You're the ones who know this business. Make sure you exercise due care in looking at these issues. Then to control your risk, remember the three shuns, right? So communication, right? Communicate your, your, your issues, uh, aggregation, get everyone together, get them on the same page, and documentation, document everything. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful talk. And I, I would like, I wish I have an hour more to continue <laughs> the chat uh, with a couple of with a glass of beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the interest of time, uh, um, I think we'll end the seminar at the webinar. Here. And on the screen, you will see a QR code for the evaluation survey. Uh, could you please take some time, uh, give us some feedback so that we can improve next time? Um, the host asking me to uh, give you a some sort of advertisement. There is an upcoming Joint Institute's NDC seminar next series. Uh, it will be held on the 11th of January 2021. The theme of the next webinar is difference in handling pain between the traditional building contractors in Hong Kong versus the NEC and the beauty of the letter executor. You like? It seems like the, the topic for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, NEC yeah. is a much better way than the traditional building contract. So let's see the argument. You would like to hear the argument between both sides. Please join this uh, seminar. It's already started. The registration has already been started, so you check your professional institution. Um, it's online participation, you qualify for one of the five CPD hours, and it is free of charge. Okay, with the further ado, thanks for coming and attending the webinar tonight, and thanks for the two speakers tonight, a wonderful talk. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.